I really hope that people can find a way to being authentically hopeful about the future of humankind. Authentic hope, which is hope grounded in a realistic and science-based understanding of the nature of the world today and our impact on it. I see politics as active citizenship as well as involvement in representative democracy. It's an illusion to think that somehow this is all going to get sorted out by people gradually coming to a set of decisions about the way they live themselves and the way they want other people to live without massive political interventions at every turn in our lives. Welcome to the podcast. It is, as ever, wonderful to be with you today and share this exploration through the pathways of co-creating a beautiful future. Thank you for the love we received from our 108th community episode celebration. It's such a joy to share this space with you. We're still waiting to hear from you through our questionnaire on how we can go about creating a community space for you online that connects us globally and also in our local communities. Please do spend five minutes to share your thoughts with us so that we can make this as useful and powerful a tool for our community as possible. You can find a link to this questionnaire if you go to our community page on our website, www.thefutureisbeautiful.co. If you click on the page community and support, you'll see it there at the top. And like I said, it's not a very sexy questionnaire, but it won't take very long. It will just give us a really good understanding of which of the various options will work best for you. And after all, this is a space that we are creating for you. If you want to dive deeper in some of the themes that we're exploring on this podcast, you are very welcome to join our membership community presence where this month the theme is grief and transformation. And we are especially looking into heartbreak, death, and how we live with this kind of grief. And the workshop for that will be at the end of the month. So you're welcome to join. And when you join, you get the whole back catalogue of workshops and resources and tools that we've been building up there for over a year, you are very welcome to become a member of Presence if you feel called. My guest today is Jonathan Porritt, who is the co-founder of Forum for the Future, an eminent writer, broadcaster and campaigner on sustainable development. Jonathan has been on the front line of environmental campaigning for more than 45 years. He's been a member of the Green Party throughout that time and has worked tirelessly to promote the solutions to today's converging environmental crisis. For those of you that have been part of the Green Movement, the environmental movement, especially in the UK, you will be familiar with Jonathan and his work. He and I actually first met in person when he was part of the board, I think as an advisor of the Electoral Reform Society. And I was an elected part of the council at the time, as we both have a belief that political change and environmental change are completely interlinked. For nearly 25 years, Forum for the Future has been working in partnership with business, governments and civil society to accelerate the shift toward a sustainable future. In addition, Jonathan is president of Population Matters, president of the Conservation Volunteers, a non-exec director of Wilmot Dixon's Holdings and a director of Collectively, an online platform celebrating sustainable innovation. He's involved in the work of many NGOs and charities as a patron, chair, or special advisor. He was formerly co-chair of the Green Party back in 1980 to 83, of which he's still a member, of course, director of Friends of the Earth from 1984 to 1990, a trustee of WWF in the UK from 1991 to 2005, and a member of the board of the Southwest Regional Development Agency from 1999 to 2008. He stood down as chair of the UK Sustainable Development Commission in July 2009 after nine years providing high-level advice to government ministers 
Jonathan received a CBE in 2000 for services to environmental protection. He has authored many books and his previous books include Capitalism as if the world matters, which was revised in 2007. The World We Made, which was published in 2013, providing a positive vision of how we get to be living in a fair and sustainable world in 2050. And then his latest book, Hope in Hell, a powerful call to action on the climate emergency, which is out now, came out this summer. In this conversation called A Call to Action, A Hope in Hell, we explore the themes of authentic hope, staying grounded, and intergenerational justice as we contemplate the question, how can we keep showing up as active citizens of change? I hope that you enjoy this episode and that it inspires or re-inspires you into action across all levels of where we need it in order to co-create this more beautiful future. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the we between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. Jonathan, I am delighted to welcome you to The Future is Beautiful. Thank you for being with us today. Great to be part of it. It's lovely. This has been an an interesting year, to say the least, Mm -hmm. and has brought a lot up to the surface. Has perhaps made some of our issues clearer if they weren't already clear before. And for many this year has opened sort of possibility and opportunity of like, you know, whether it's changes in our personal life, you know, there's stories of people quitting their jobs and moving off grid, or there's stories of people really showing up in their communities or committing to lifestyle shifts that will take us to a more sustainable future. As well as that, there's a lot of overwhelm at this time. And senses of, of, you know, where can one even find their place within this system, which in many ways seems to be more disconnected from some of the aspects of where we know we need to be going. And at least that perhaps the, the media sway is one that creates a lot of fear and pessimism. (laughs) <laughs> yeah I don't think the media know how to operate in a way that doesn't engender fear and pessimism it's their basic coinage frankly it had a deleterious effect on the lives of well countless people all around the world it's a pervasive tone and culture that is deeply inhumane disrespectful of what it is that makes people's contribution so special and ultimately very destructive of the human spirit and of the the bonds that tie society together. So the role of the mass media, both print and uh, social media, and even more the case with social media, is hugely problematic because it plays to the worst interpretation that some people have of human nature and makes huge amounts of money out of doing that, which means that they can essentially ride roughshod over people who have completely countervailing insights into and narratives about human beings seen very differently. So it's a big big problem for all of us. Yeah, and social media is so... it, It gets into those really private places because 
for many people, phones, seeing, checking social media is like a early morning, a late night, a multiple times a day thing. And so it kind of, it catches us off guard a lot and then gets deep into our psyches. Yeah. I think one of the most telling bits of information about this is the number of Silicon Valley millionaires and billionaires who ration the number of hours a day their children can be on their phones or devices. And, and they impose that as a discipline on their children. And for me, that says a lot about their understanding of the essential systems, the algorithms on which these social media platforms are based. And it says a lot about the knowledge they have of the damage that is doing to young people. Although the, we know about those, those wealthy Silicon Valley types who have this attitude to this massive engine of social media interventions that they've created. But nobody seems to learn from their lesson. If I was a parent, I'd probably take my, my learning from them rather than I would from the next social media enthusiast who makes out that it's all wonderful, particularly for young people, which I don't think it is. But there'll be a balancing, Amisha. There's always a balancing in these things. And I think we're still going through a period where a lot of it is still a bit frenetic and so superficially inclusive and fascinating and tantalizing with the promise of newness always around the next corner. But will that be part of our lives indefinitely? Not in my book. Not in my book. I know a lot of young people, um, including our own daughter, who have just said, it's all just ephemeral. It's sort of frippery. It adds nothing to life. All it does is take away from it. It just complicates things. It's time consuming. After a while, it's boring. So what's the point? And apart from keeping in touch with friends very closely and personally, which can be done without necessarily being obsessively on your devices every minute of every day, then a lot of, I think, more and more young people just think this is nothing much to do with what they aspire to achieve in life. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because I've been thinking about you know, how much effort, even just with an episode of this podcast, we put into the social media kind of graphics and and making and, and putting it out there. And because the algorithms aren't that interested in a beautiful future, <laughs> <laughs> we don't really the, the posts they don't they don't do anything near as much as they used to. And so it's actually not how we're creating community and how people are finding this show and, and this community and and so I, yeah, I've been going through that recently of like actually maybe, maybe we don't need to do any of that stuff and that that is actually a waste of time and resources it's definitely a, a moment of allowing ourselves to to think differently and to free ourselves but I can imagine for you when you do put a lot of work into something like that you want people to get access to it and if there are means by which you can introduce new people to the podcast, then you want to do that. So it would be quite brave for you to say, I'm having nothing more to do with that. I'm just going to rely on my faithfuls. I'm sure they're all very reliable. And on stray encounters in the ether, which is a bit risky, I mean, if you don't mind me saying, because you, you, <laughs> you know, it might not necessarily play out as well as you hope. Yeah, well, we'll see where my <laughs> courage and calculated risk takes me <laughs> with that adventure. Exactly. But if we're to go back to the bigger picture of this time and where sustainability comes into this moment, I say that because it's not as big on our agenda this year in terms of if we're going to kind of tie it in with this this media conversation, because we had that last year. <laughs> and so now this year, there are other things. And at this time, you have put out a book with a very bold statement of what's possible. Yeah, I hope so. We need boldness, that's for sure. What do you make of this time? I think the contrast was so, so painful. And again, I see a lot of this through the eyes of people these days. But we got to the end of 2019 with an extraordinary, incredible amount of energy around climate campaigning, sustainability, biodiversity, social justice, 
this year, apart from the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been incredible and took COVID off the front pages and made it possible for people to think again about really deep structural issues in our society, about racial inequality and social justice. But apart from that, it's been almost impossible to replicate some of that energy that was there in 2019. I guess the pragmatist in me just says, well, that's the nature of something like a pandemic. It's impossible to carve out an equal amount of space and interests and opportunities to engage when you've got the backdrop of every single person, pretty much in every single country all around the world, focused on just this one thing and the impact that this one thing is having on their lives and their prospects, um, their economic well-being and so on. And you just have to acknowledge that this is utterly extraordinary, unique, completely disruptive of every expectation we might otherwise have had. So I think a lot of people in the climate movement have simply said, forget 2020, nothing much is going to happen. And probably until we're into a period of time where either the pandemic has receded because the virus is changing or whatever, or we've got a vaccine, which means that more and more people will have some kind of protection against COVID-19. Until that time, it's impossible to bring back those, those agendas, if you like, in the way that we were able to do in 2019. And I think that is realistic. It's unfortunate. Every year lost, as you know, is uh, another blow to our prospects of getting to where we need to be by pick your date, 2030, 2050, end of the century. We've got all these deadlines ahead of us now. You know, for me, I having been through so many ups and downs over the 45 years in terms of the way social movements surge and then recede and come back again and make an impact one moment and then disappear. This is a sort of, that is a constant part of progressive radical campaigning. And I've seen that many, many times over the years. It just so happens a pandemic is the most dramatic of the disruptive elements that I've ever seen, obviously, dwarfs everything else. So it's unfortunate, but I, I'm relatively comfortable that behind the focus on COVID-19, a lot more people, a lot more people are beginning to see the true story about the state of our planet and the impact of our current model of growth on that planet and what we need to do about it. And they're beginning to combine that, to connect that up with their concerns about fairness and justice and finding ways of living in balance and living more compassionately on this earth. And those connections haven't really, they haven't been very strong in the past for all sorts of different reasons. And now I think, I think they're getting stronger all the time, all the time. And you must hear that a lot in the conversations that you're having, is that the reality of what's going on in people's lives today in 2020 through this pandemic, that reality, it's not necessarily the reality we read about and hear about on the news or that characterizes so many documentary programs or all the sort of froth about coping with a pandemic feels like. It's not, that isn't actually the reality. There's a lot going on at a deeper level. Yeah, it's like life's gone a bit underground. Yeah. But it's all still happening. I'm fascinated. I think this is probably one of those weird celestial serendipities, which I keep an eye on all the time. But right now, there's some utterly fascinating stuff going on here in the UK and in the USA, as I discovered yesterday, about fungi and about the amazing presence of fungi in our lives, even though most of it is, of course, invisible by definition, because it's all going on. <laughs> under the earth. And there's this brilliant new book out here in the UK by a guy called Merlin Sheldrick. On, um, it's just essentially about, I could put it like the magic of mushrooms, as it were, which is what is the role of fungi in sustaining earth's systems, the role it plays in forests and soils and everything else. It's a, most, it's a wonderful cultured look at, at this. And there's another new book out at almost exactly the same time in the USA, together with a film talking about the centrality of fungi in the lives of people, even though the vast majority of people have absolutely no idea what that really means. That's Paul Stamets, like, fantastic fungi, yeah. Yeah, do you know that? Yeah. It's quite something, isn't it? <laughs> so, 
I like that. And I like the fact that you can draw, you can definitely draw hope from that. In fact, one of the quotes in my book is by the wonderful Rebecca Solnit, who is one of my go-to favorite authors and campaigners of all time. And she often draws on the analogy of socially progressive movements being a bit like uh, fungi in, in that what you see does not necessarily reflect the reality of what that movement actually is. You can take it from me, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely way of looking at the fact that all of our movements, progressive movements, are much, much more than the sum of what you see on the surface. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm taking a moment with those words because as you say it, I'm actually experiencing my perception shift and seeing all of the invisibility that isn't broken by not being allowed to meet up in person and, and do certain actions or, or what's being covered or where attention is perceived to be. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a fine line there between... <laughs> authentic hope and illusion but anyway you know <laughs> we, we need to think that there's a lot more going on that is invisible than might be the case so you have to do your own reality checking from time i have to do my own reality checking as in do you just want that to be the case jonathan or is it actually really what's going on is that really a better representation of where we are and in terms of this balance of different issues or are you just making it up to keep yourself hopeful <laughs> <laughs> yeah and but i guess my question to that is does it even matter and and can we ever know well we can know we can know because we can do we can do research into these things some time ago there was another um, another amazing book by paul hawkin a wonderful u.s entrepreneur and disruptor and he wrote a book called the blessed unrest and he set out on this, actually, he acknowledged this himself, this completely ludicrous effort to try and compute, to calculate the aggregate value of all the world's socially progressive movements, even including a count of how many NGOs there were or how many cooperatives or how many community groups or whatever it was. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. And he said, you know, he said, I haven't, I barely scratched the surface. But in fact, when you look at it, the representation in our formal media today of this incredible constant outpouring of love and commitment to other people is ridiculous. It's just, you can hardly understand what this looks like because we haven't got the lens on it. We haven't got the means of seeing it. We don't have these narratives in our lives as much as we need to. So you can do research. Paul, he's a good friend of mine. He said afterwards, I would never, if anyone had put that idea to me, I would never have done that. As a research project, I would have done it as a way of kind of summoning up a different understanding of the power of human nature in, in our lives. And then he said, does it matter? Well, that's a tricky one. I think it, I think it does matter. I think it does matter. I've tried, I've tried in the book to distinguish between what I eventually settled on as a, as a description, what I call authentic hope, which is hope grounded in a realistic and science-based understanding of the nature of the world today and our impact on it. And against authentic hope, I set up a contrast with what I call shiny optimism, which are all these people who kind of bubble up all over the place, often with wonderful, crazy enthusiasm for a particular technology or a big idea, whatever it might be, and particularly technology. And they're absolutely convinced that technology is going to sort out all our problems and that we don't have to worry about these big issues about food security and accelerating climate change and all the rest of it, because technology will do the job. From that point of view, relax. It's, it's going to be okay. The human genius is such that now we know the nature of the problem, <laughs> we'll get it sorted. And those shiny optimists, I can't help this, they make me absolutely furious. They just drive me mad. So does it matter? Yes, it matters. I want people, I really hope that people can find a way to being authentically hopeful about the future of humankind. But I strongly urge them not to do it via 
techno-driven, spurious optimism, because that, that does not help anybody at all. Do we not need some people that are engineers that are looking at... Yeah, no, no, sorry. I didn't mean to say we don't need them. Mike, we absolutely need the technologies and we need the engineers and we need the innovators and the inventors and all of those brilliant people. But what we don't then want them to do is to say, that's all we have to do is to keep on innovating the next shiny thing, big idea, bees of wheeze, whatever you call it. We need so much more than that to resolve the issues in the world today. So no, I'm a big, I'm a big enthusiast for lots of technology. I mean, it plays a very, very important part in the transition that we're just starting out on. Yeah, because my sense is that the role of hope is that it it keeps the human spirit alive and functioning and able to participate and communicate and engage. And when we're in a place where where that's missing us as individual humans or as communities or societies or countries then we're in a lot of trouble because that that is what what keeps everything going and so I suppose when I said does it matter there was like the flippancy was more in like that I feel like we need to get our hope where we can get it based on our differing circumstances like that might be coming from a different place I totally agree with that it is it is very hard to sustain one's energy and passion and commitment to a cause if if you don't have hope in the prospect of it making a difference it is possible in, in fact in some of the research i did for the for the um i looked at two i wanted to sort of see if there were any analogies from history that would inform our discussions about the climate movement today so i spent a bit of time looking both at women's suffrage and the campaign to abolish slavery because both of those for various reasons were campaigns that went on over many decades i mean the women's suffrage movement was 60 years and the campaign to abolish slavery was a little bit longer in the united states less in in the uk but longer in the usa so sustaining hope through prolonged periods of time like that is an extraordinary thing. And there are some very moving testimonies of people who got involved in these campaigns very young and were still campaigning with the same degree of purpose and personal commitment and passion 40, 50 years on. So if your cause is right, and I know that may be a tendentious way of putting it, but if your cause is right and you're commitment to it is strong, then it is possible to remain hopeful. Because why would you suddenly give up on hope? The only reason why you give up of maintaining a hopeful orientation here is because you've come to the conclusion that everything you're doing isn't going to make any difference. And that's why the climate movement is a bit different from women's suffrage and from the abolition movement, because, because it is possible that we will come to a point in the not too distant future where actually it is too late to stop the the onslaught of accelerating climate change that is physically possible as we know we're beginning to see some very pronounced and dramatic impacts of climate change and, and all the scientists tell us this is moving so much faster than we thought and we are at risk now of triggering these tipping points where whole systems tip over into another state and it's never a state that makes life better for humankind. It's always a state that is going to make life infinitely worse for humankind. So it is a different thing, the climate campaign. Because I imagine, I, I was thinking about this, throughout that time where people were pursuing women's suffrage, all of the amazing women, and a few men, but amazing women along the way, year after year after year after year, they never lost hope because they could see that there would obviously come a point where every woman would be treated from a suffrage point of view in exactly the same way as every man. There's no reason why that dream would have suddenly evaporated or disappeared. And the same with the abolition movement. There was always a prospect. This, we are going to get there. We are going to get there. And in so doing, we will end injustice and suffering for every single person after that point, every woman in the case of suffrage and every slave or trafficked person after the 
abolition. That's what makes climate a weird one. It's what underpins a lot of this eco-angst and a lot of the trauma that people are now experiencing in the light of climate disasters. Can you share what the latest science is around the tipping points that are potentially coming next? <laughs> I'm Not going sure from I'm, hope hope to like you are <laughs> yeah. Hope to hell here, Anisha. Not sure how, <laughs> how beautiful a prospect this is of our world. Wait, hope not hell. <laughs> no, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of these tipping points, and the wildfires have obviously made people sit up and think, "Oh, this is shocking." I mean, whether it's the west coast of America, Australia, the Russian Arctic, massive fires in Brazil, I think you know people have suddenly realised, okay, so we call it global warming. What that means is that things are getting hotter. What that means is the conditions for increased and more intense fires are sort of accelerating all the time. And that is going to translate into the constant wildfire phenomenon. The vast majority of people in California know that every single year they're going to have really bad wildfires. Every single year. They may change forestry management regimes and they'll have some years that are bad and some years that are not so bad, but it's now a constant. So wildfires have changed perception, but the one that I think scientists are really now very intently focused on is this whole question of melting ice and melting ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And this year alone, we've had just shocking revelations from the state of the Greenland ice cap to the melting sea ice in the Arctic, and now suddenly new evidence about the speed with which some of the Big glaciers in the Antarctic are melting and the sea ice in Antarctica. People sort of know this because we do, it does pop up in, in the media. Every now and then you get this, you know, the next dreadful scientific study that tells us how many billions or trillions of tons of ice have melted in the preceding year. In the back of their mind, an awful lot of people know that what the science projection now is that there will be a minimum sea level rise of one meter by the end of this century. So by 2100, the very best prospect for humankind is no more than a one meter sea level rise. And of course, a meter means devastation to the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So many of our cities are much less than a meter above sea level. And that's only 80 years away. And of course, it won't, we won't suddenly go from where we are now to, oh gosh, it's gone suddenly from where we are today to a meter, an increased meter, it'll gradually increase in the intervening 80 years. And that's pretty staggering. But the tipping point... M much like the fires, yeah. there's just, just more of them and they're coming more often. Exactly. And so it will be the same with the, with the sea levels. It will, because the melting phenomenon will itself accelerate. And there's some astonishing footage on the internet about actual tracking of particular glaciers and the speed with which they have melted. There's one just popped up on the internet uh, last week about a glacier in Greenland showing 2013 to 2020, so not a long span of time. I mean, it, it, this means the glacier would have been weakened anyway, but you couldn't see it visibly. But this is a visible representation of how that glacier literally then slid away completely into the sea. And the tipping point story is once that process starts going faster, then can you actually stop the melting? And that is a massive question because Greenland, if the whole of the Greenland ice cap disappears, that's seven meters of additional sea level, which is sort of game over for humankind, basically, as we know it. Now, that's not going to happen by the end of the century. We do absolutely know that these vast masses of ice in the Antarctic and the Arctic, they, they, they're so deep that there's no way that can happen that quickly. But even so, if it's too late to stop it, at some point in the relatively near future for the human species, we would then be looking at sea level rises of upwards of seven, eight, nine, ten meters, and then more. So those tipping points, once you've kind of got your mind around a tipping point, 
boy, does it shape your sense of urgency. <laughs> and Okay, you do not want this system to tip. Trust me, this is not something that you should be feeling comfortable or relaxed about. And that's what I find so moving about young people when they talk about this, because I'm 70 and 2100, I'm, I'm obviously not going to be experiencing that. If I'm lucky, I'll still be banging on about these things in 2050. That would be great. But for young people below the age of 20 today, they could very easily still be alive in 2100. Their scoping of this story is completely different because that means every single year of the rest of their lives will be affected by the prospect of that minimum sea level rise and then even more grim prospect of the tipping point and it being too late. Have we done enough on the doom and gloom now? I mean, what do you think? Because I think, I think, you know, I've discovered over the years, there's only so much of this stuff that people can cope with. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. I, I just felt like we needed to bring the perspective in. So this is something that I'm really interested in. How do you cope with that? When you hear stuff like that, where do you go to make sense of it emotionally and personally? How do you deal with it? Yeah, where I used to go was panicked action. <laughs> like, right. you know, almost like this place of like, well, okay, well, how can I stop it? And I think now I've been an activist and working in various organizations for 15 years now in sustainability. And for me, it's been painfully slow to watch and disheartening at multiple times where I've landed at this moment is that I have to connect my spirituality with my sense of what it is to be a human. And I feel that through yoga and through the, the traditions of my, of my family, of my lineage, that one of the skills that I've learned is to sit with uncertainty. It's, that sounds passive, but it doesn't mean to sit and do nothing because there's uncertainty, but it means to be able to live fully with the uncertainty. And, and, and for my generation, you know, I'm in my mid to late thirties. And so I had like the childhood in the boom, the nineties and all of that kind of fun and and then I had technology you know Facebook <laughs> Facebook came in as I left university I'm in the generation like I'm just shy a few years of those that got grants to go to university and got more steady jobs and got mortgages you know I, I kind of I, and <laughs> so but I'm not like of the younger generation that never were never told that they were going to have that stuff yeah. so I, I found myself in that place where I grew up thinking that there was all this possibility and ease about what being a kind of a grown up would be and that actually that has been shifting and shifting and shifting i have learned a kind of adaptability that isn't always easy and isn't always graceful but for me that feels like one of the best and, and most important skills that i can have dealing with this kind of information i'm constantly inquiring and experimenting, I suppose, with where to find my place in being part of giving us as humanity more of a chance, that kind of acceptance that it's not that simple. Yeah. And so I, I guess that's where I am today. Mm. It's always been a a sort of interesting thing for me, which is how people determine the right balance of, in their lives of what they, what they do to help themselves grow and develop internally, personally, and what they do to act outside that, that themselves to ensure that the world allows for that kind of more reflective, meditative position, if you like. There's a notion of spiritual activism which i've always been really rather intrigued by which is that in a way one's spiritual insights and understanding is an even more powerful call to radical action than political insights now not many people would agree with that most people would say that activism stems 
primarily from the political precepts that you subscribe to, from your sense of, of why the world isn't, isn't working in the way that it should be working, whether that's a justice-based thing or a, a racial inequality thing or sustainability, whatever it might be. But there is a really interesting story that, in fact, if you dig deep into the, the sort of origins of and the teaching of all spiritual traditions, there is a case to be made that the call to action that comes from that spiritual heartland can be at least as moving for people as any political, ideological call to action. And I'm quite intrigued by that. There's a lovely book by a guy called Alistair Macintosh, a Scottish wise person, just lovely teacher and wise person. And, he, and the title of his book was Spiritual Activism. And it's, uh, he's, he sort of raises this call for a, a militant understanding of spiritually minded communities and people to help shape the world in a different way. It's powerful stuff. Yeah. For me, it's vital and it, it really is the way in which I, I live my life. You know, it's hard for me to even know if it was the spiritual or the political that ever motivated me, because even though I didn't always identify as a spiritual person or, you know, wasn't connected to a group or a tradition for a lot of my time and was more kind of a campaigner and like activist in a more kind of political way. I feel like when I boil it down, like I always had that sense that that is in some ways a transcendent sense that can see where justice is out of balance and where power is out of balance and can see sort of beyond what's here into what's possible. It boils down to something of, of a language thing, because I think that all of us humans have that capacity as part of human yeah. spirit, whether we associate ourselves as being spiritual or being connected to some kind of organization. Like for me, that that is just part of being human, that there is an, an invisibility to our experience, much like with the mushrooms, you know, that that exists between us as humans. And for me, I think one of the things that, that I've found lacking in spaces where I've done, for example, a lot of political activism is not taking the inner work, the inner transformation part seriously. Because for me, that inner transformation and the systemic change are very linked because we need that in order to be able to see differently and to not get sort of stuck in so much of this sort of organizational, political infighting mess that can just can drain everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also because that relationship with power is such a tricky tightrope. And we see that all the time, how difficult that is to navigate. But I think that's something that Extinction Rebellion did really well. And I think that's why it captivated so many, especially young people, because there was a place where the activism and that sort of sense of spiritual and community and that possibility could live together. Was certainly, yeah, a wonderfully refreshing embrace of creativity and different ideas coming forward in, in ways that are artistically very rich and satisfying, as well as from an activist point of view, very effective. I think the spiritual side, I detect in XR a, <laughs> a characteristic nervousness about using the notion of spirituality as something that plays so differently with different people. And you can see that, as you know, throughout the Green Movement. There are lots of people in the Green Movement who still to this day recoil at the idea of being invited to embrace a more spiritual perspective of what needs to happen on this earth. And that's been a constant in my life as a campaigner. When I went to Friends of the Earth in 1984, which was admittedly a very small organization in those days. But the idea that there was a deep spiritual core to the work we needed to do in service to the earth and the environment, that was considered to be flaky beyond belief, dodgy, leftover, hippie, eco-la-la, as it was often described. And don't mess up the Friends of the Earth worldview, which is driven by science and by rationality and by needing to earn respect from decision makers and people in parliament and all the rest of it. And if you start talking all that spiritual stuff, Jonathan, <laughs> all you'll do 
this damage our reputation. And I was quite taken aback by that to start with. I mean, I learned to live with it, but it was very pronounced. There wasn't any messing around about it. If you want to do that, it's like, you know, it's a bit like closet religion. Go away and back in your closet and do all your spirituality stuff on your own time. Hug your own trees. Don't get out there and hug trees in the name of Friends of the Earth because people will just think you're wacky. It's interesting, though, because politics and religion are allowed to be very closely tied. And religion <laughs> is spirituality. So it baffles me. I, I mean, I, I've, I've lived with this and been teased about things or felt to hide things or even not allowed myself to fully delve into those parts of myself. But if you're part of like an organized religion, then it's that's OK to also be political and an activist a campaign you know it, it's a little bit off isn't it <laughs> like where these rules come in <laughs> of what seems to be okay yeah my god so many examples where politics and religion don't work terribly well together in terms of improving the lot of humankind in general i mean boy so much political damage has been done in the name of political parties or leaders who have, driven, have been driven in part by religious zealotry or some kind of absolutism. I mean, look at what's happening in India at the moment, and there the politics and the religion side of it are reshaping the destiny of that nation of 1.3 billion people in the most extraordinary and overt way. You look at the damage done to US politics now because of religious fundamentalism, where Donald Trump will still continue to get a lot of votes in the next election please, please, not enough, but a lot of votes, because there are very large numbers of evangelicals and fundamentalists who would vote for him almost regardless. So that putting together of politics and religion, it rarely works well for humankind. Well, and, and the way that then religion or the parts of us that are more sentient are targeted through the social media and how that's leading to a lot more fundamentalism. I mean, it, it is all a mess, but I think when I'm talking about my spirituality, it's something much more private than that. And it's much more around intention and being connected to a sense of, of my own truth so that I can practice discernment. It's not anti-science at all. It embraces all of it, you know, I find that just being connected to my spirituality allows me to be more resilient, to find more grounded hope, to be more grounded actually helps me to not get anxious about the future. Yeah, it's a consciousness that is very open to, to science and to what's actually happening in the world. Like, it, it's not the shiny optimism, like, oh, the world's perfect. It's all love. It actually just allows me to kind of tap into a more grounded, whole way of being in this reality that we're in. Is it grounded as in earthbound? I suppose what I'm, are you a pagan? Because people's spirituality, when they took, say being grounded, I've always been fascinated by that word because for me, grounded means it means literally finding that set of connections between ourselves and the ground under our feet and nature. And it's quite a powerful set of connectivities and mutual responsibilities and all the rest of it. But then grounded is a very big word in the sort of spiritual world about I must be more grounded. And quite often people don't mean I need to find a better relationship between myself and the living world. They don't mean that at all. They just mean they've got to get a better balance in themselves. They've got to do more to get their spiritual checks and balances working more effectively. So I'm just, I'm sorry, it's an unfair question, but I'm just throwing it back to you. When you say grounded, does that include an earth practice, an earth focused practice? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that those two things are very connected and having a relationship with the earth and with nature that is reciprocal allows me to also be more grounded in myself and in the way that I'm able to show up. That can look like rituals and it can look like making offerings and altars and it can also just be about 
going for that walk, riding one's bike, you know, looking up at the stars, walking with presence on the earth and remembering the beauty of nature. And this is our home. And that sense that kind of, that connects us to why climate change is important in a sense that isn't about preserving this this particular way of life, but that is about a relationship with something else that is alive. Absolutely. Yes, I remember once um, chatting to James Jones about this, who is the former Bishop of Liverpool, lovely guy, very focused on environmental issues. He, he's an evangelical. He spent a lot of his life trying to persuade American evangelicals. They really were not doing themselves any favours by denying the reality of climate change or by ignoring the state of the of the earth and it was fascinating because he picked up on this sort of phrase that a lot of environmentalists use which is that you can't protect that which you do not love as in we need to have an emotional set of drivers for the work we do because without that emotional reinforcement to our intellectual commitments that things can get very problematic for people. It, it's difficult to sustain that kind of campaign. And James said it's an interesting phrase because what, what is it that makes people love something else or somebody else or whatever? And, of course, he then, he then said that when he's talking to evangelicals, he tries to take them back to the basic understanding and teaching in their religion which is all about a creative world. And so he, when he was in America, he would say, you can't protect that which you do not revere. And we have to have reverence for the world because the world is created by God. And if the world is part of the creation, then we have to show reverence for it. And it was very interesting. And he sort of said, love, it doesn't kind of tell you enough about what your obligation is as a religious person. It's too sort of open-ended, but the concept of reverence is different. For a Christian, for instance, for, a, for people from many religious faiths, reverence goes a lot, lot further than the notion of love. And I was fascinated by that. I'd never really thought about that deepening story before. And it makes sense. I mean, even if, we, if we're to think about it in a really kind of simplistic tone, when on social media we're being sold the sweatshop trainers or the silk pillowcase or whatever it is, they are using these very bright minds to make an emotional connection of why you need to put your resources into buying that thing. Nature isn't using the same tactics. <laughs> so we have to pay a bit more attention, but it's just as if not much more powerful when you do create that relationship with the beauty of Earth. Yeah. That then, of course, you're working for Earth. Polly Higgins, you know, she, her words were like, the Earth needs a lawyer. You can find that relationship where it is, it is an emotional driver that is allowing you to, to be in service. And all that means is that you're also able to be more attentive to the science and to the different ways in which you can be an activist and a campaigner. Yeah, exactly. So you and I are of the same mind, which is reassuring. <laughs> I think we probably knew that. <laughs> Now I'm getting an idea of doing a social media campaign. So if anyone's listening that can help make this happen, like let's make it happen. But actually to employ some of these tactics that are used to make people feel reverence for the trainers, to feel reverence in a different way. And I know it's being done in some ways, but it's often done in a kind of guilt-leaden, like you've got to stop this. And But I, I don't find it done it in a way that's about making that emotional connection no and that would be something fantastic so if anyone's listening that wants to be part of making that happen let's do it yeah <laughs> i think you're right i i've long felt that we needed a balance of all of these different things you can't do it without the science and the rationality and being aware of what it is that makes political systems and economic systems work you have to have all of that but that is never going to be sufficient given the nature of the transformation we're now 
looking to, it's never going to be sufficient. So we have to balance that with a lot more understanding what moves people emotionally and spiritually. And I suppose the bridge there is a lot about the psychology of change. I mean, people are now thinking a lot more about what is going to have to happen to make it possible for people to make these changes because they want these changes, not to make the changes because somebody tells them they have to make the changes or out of a sense of guilt or kind of grumpy compliance. You know, this has to be embraced. And and we're so far away from that sense of embracing this better future. At the moment, the best you can hope for is that we somehow navigate our way through these difficult years without our democratic freedom and our human rights being eroded. And we'll be lucky if we can arrive in a good, sustainable, compassionate, fair world without losing our democracy, for instance. A lot of people think it's going to be impossible to do that unless you impose this in some sort of dreadful fascistic or autocratic way. The only answer to that is don't, please don't get into the business of advocating China-style transformation, which is too scary even to contemplate because of the loss of, of freedom that that entails. But get into the discussion about how can we help people to embrace this, to feel excited by the transformation, to feel that it speaks to their better nature rather than that it's depriving them of something that they have valued up until now. That's the different narrative, completely different narrative. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about that. We're not very good at that in the world of sustainability. Hello, we're taking a short pause from the conversation. On behalf of our team and our community, thank you for being here and co-creating The Future is Beautiful. Much dedication, love and time goes into the production of this show. We believe in being advertising free in a world that's always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And so we make this show with you and for you, thanks to your support. There are three ways you can be more involved so we can share the vision, wisdom, and creativity here as we explore what it means to be a human in this time. You can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, posting episodes on social media, and doing iTunes reviews. You can support as a patron by making a monthly or one-off donation of your choice. And with this, you join the global patrons group and monthly video calls where we share connection and insight. You get to know the other amazing patrons from around the world, their stories and their work, and you offer direct support to me and the team, as well as being brought into the behind the scenes of creating something like this. It sounds like a lot, but it's as much or as little as you want to get involved in. You can become a member of Presence, our membership collective of care and practice, where we explore how to embody the themes of the podcast with workshops, calls, special events, tree whispers, and powerful tools, practices, and rituals that you can bring into your life. This is open to absolutely everybody as we create an inclusive and diverse space that celebrates well-being as a human right where we explore together what it means to be creative, courageous, and connected to ourselves, each other, and the earth. This is about embodying sacred activism. We love meeting patrons and presence members and how being part in this way weaves our lives together as well as making the show possible. If anything from this conversation has moved or inspired you, please get more involved. All information can be found at www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community this show really can't go on without your patronage and presence membership so please do make it happen and now back to the conversation this is probably a question that you get asked a lot and i know that there's never a simple answer but the question that everyone always has is given where we're at given all of the science given the complexity And given your experience over 45 years and all the work that you've done, how does somebody that isn't part of an organization or find like their way of contributing to the changes that we need? You know, one of the things I love about Greta Thunberg, who I just think is phenomenal and and a brilliant sort of role model for not just young people, but but for anybody who's trying to work out 
what leadership looks like in this world of ours. The thing I love about her is that whenever she's asked that question about, so what should I do, Greta? What do you want me to do? And she's kind of, I've seen it on a couple of occasions. Uh, no, I've, I don't know her personally, but I've seen it on a couple of occasions. This kind of slightly resigned look comes over her face and she says, okay, so the first thing you have to do <laughs> is find out what's happening because I can pretty much guarantee that you won't have spent much time, if any time, actually exploring the reality of climate change and what's happening and what it means for all of us. So the first exhortation she has is just be curious, find out about it, go to the places which will give you reliable information about this stuff. And when you've got that knowledge, it doesn't have, you don't have to turn yourself into a kind of crazy climate PhD scientist, but when you've got that basic knowledge about what's happening and the curiosity has led you to dig a bit deeper into this, then so many things emerge from that deeper knowledge. So you will go from that knowledge to an awareness that the world cannot possibly sustain the amount of meat eating that we have in the world today. It is literally not possible. It's wrong on so many other counts as well, to do with the environment, to do with well-being, animal welfare and ethical issues. But it, we can't do it anyway. It's just not possible to produce the food that we need to give to the livestock so that we can kill and eat them. And what Greta says is, okay, you'll probably come to the conclusion that firstly you need to reduce the amount of meat that you eat in your diets very significantly. You might then move on to the next stage, which is you become a vegetarian. You might move on at that point to become a vegan. But I'm not going to tell you what to do because you need to know why eating less meat makes sense if you're worried about climate change rather than me sticking up my little teacherly finger at the grand old age of 17 <laughs> telling you that you should be eating less meat. I mean, why are you going to listen to me if you haven't done your own homework in that area? I admire that because a lot of people look to her for guidance and advice, and she is wise to an extraordinary degree for someone of that age. But she's very careful. She doesn't provide lifestyle guidance. She says a lot of this falls on your shoulders. And if you're really serious about this, then you need to do your homework. Yeah, that's a very smart way that she has to answer that question. I'm just thinking about our friends listening to this conversation. And there will be somebody that doesn't know much about climate change that might be listening to this for the first time and going, oh, I didn't know I could eat less meat. But I can guarantee that, that the majority, I'd say probably 90% of the people listening to this conversation know a lot about the science, know a lot about the lifestyle shifts, have made a lot of those shifts and have a sense that they're not doing enough and that they don't know how much is enough and that if anything they're, they're bordering on martyrdom or they've way over the martyr line oh gosh <laughs> you know i mean i talk a lot about the recovering martyr because i've been in that place as somebody really committed to sustainability and you know i used to be one of those people that would just get really upset about excess things that could have been recycled and all of that and i just found that it was it, the level of anxiety that it was creating and the fact that I was running out of friends was like, okay, <laughs> I have to reassess slightly my approach. But one thing that I have found is that I want to say like kind of looking down the nose at people like in the sustainability movement and like you might post an article that you think's inspiring and then like three people will comment and tell you why actually there's counter science to everything that you've just posted so you might become vegan but then we're getting into all the issues around soy or how oatly is now sold out and then you just get stuck in these loops and then meanwhile none of the statistics are changing <laughs> on the tipping points that we're moving towards i want to receive the wisdom of your experience and perspective for those that are in that place that are already in a place where most of their way of life has shifted out of what is the dominant culture and yet what is enough and how do you know if you're being effective and the fact that science seems to be something that is yeah that you're kind of able to find science on both sides of a lot of these choices 
that you might be making in your own life. Right. Okay. Well, those are two slightly different things. I, and I just on the toing and froing on the lifestyle decisions, as it were, you suddenly make a decision about something and the next day you read something that says that's the wrong decision. My sense of all of that is to just don't obsess about it. By and large, we kind of know the direction of travel here and how to reduce our personal impact and society's impact in general. I came to the conclusion a long time ago that there's never one absolutely right way of doing that day after day after day. But as long as we stick to the basics in terms of what that means for how we live and how we treat other people, honestly, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. And people who become totally geeky about being absolutely right in every particular of the way they live, life's too short for that. And unfortunately, it probably isn't going to make much difference anyway. So that's my first reassuring story. Don't sweat perfection. Enjoy adequacy. Maybe that's my rule of thumb. Where would I be if I hadn't, as a very imperfect vessel in this world, where would I be by now if I hadn't invented my own rule of thumb about that? The second thing is to do turn to the difficult bits. I've noticed a lot of people don't want to talk much, for instance, about money when you get into this story. But the way people use their money and their investments, and not just purchasing, but the power of money to make good things happen in other people's lives and better things happen in your life in terms of your pensions or investments. And a lot of people peculiarly still hang back from rethinking their financial responsibilities. You know, I can still, I can regularly meet people and I will just ask them a very simple question. Do you know that your pension, because everybody has a pension now, do you know that your pension is not invested in, say, fossil fuel companies? And they'll kind of go, oh, God, Jonathan, oh, God. No, but, but how do I do this? And you think, okay, so you know that you shouldn't be invested in fossil fuel companies. You know that in a, if you were in a better place, you wouldn't be invested in fossil fuel companies. You could have chosen to get out of fossil fuel companies 20 years ago. Now is the moment to do it. And don't look to me for a place to go to answer all your questions in that area because that's lazy. That's lazy. Do your homework. So that's the money side of it, which is probably now alienating most of your followers here. I mean, no, I, I'm sure it's not. I mean, I would say that I'm not sure that everyone <laughs> listening has a pension. Well, these days, people who are in work, you don't have a choice. Everybody has a pension and you can choose what you do with it. So. And then thirdly, and this is to make myself even more unpopular, is you cannot avoid the politics. You can't avoid it. I'm sorry. It's an illusion to think that somehow this is all going to get sorted out by people gradually coming to a set of decisions about the way they live themselves and the way they want other people to live without massive political interventions at every turn in our lives. So I don't understand what climate activism looks like that doesn't include involvement in politics. I just don't. I feel that very strongly, to be honest, and people who are nervous about getting involved in politics or might just about acknowledge the importance of casting a vote every now and then as their commitment to politics. That's not good enough in my book because the politics of this is ultimately what's going to shape it, not the personal lifestyle choices we make. It's funny because I know you don't want to like give... You don't want people not to be lazy. And I don't want to encourage laziness either. But I also want to encourage inspiration and to not be overwhelmed and to sort of see through. So when you talk about an involvement in politics beyond voting, what kind of things are you suggesting? Joining parties, being activists within pressure groups, standing for local council? All of that. All of that. And whatever feels right. You know, I joined the Green Party in 1974, and I'm still a member of the Green Party, but I am comfortable with party politics. I know a lot of people who are not comfortable with party politics, and I don't, <laughs> I don't necessarily blame them either, because party politics isn't always what you want it to be, to say the least. But there are so many other ways of being politically involved. And actually, for me, probably now, it's more this sense of small p politics. What can I do to be politically activist in my own community, in the place where I live? 
How can I get involved in, in the causes that matter to me in practice? I call that politics. It's not just the democratic side of it. It's the political engagement in causes and movements and charities and cooperatives and community groups where you have a chance to be an active citizen. I see politics as active citizenship as well as involvement in representative democracy. And aren't the lifestyle shifts also active politics in that way? Or or do you see a differentiation and where is it different? It can be. For instance, the whole, the lifestyle shift, I'm a patron of an organization called Compassion and World Farming, which I love as an organization. And it's, it's a very incredibly thoughtful, conscientious organization because it's science and data are always impeccable. But it starts from the premise that we have no right to be inflicting untold cruelty on billions and billions of creatures. We just have no right to do this. And it is utterly utterly immoral that we continue to do it. So as someone moves away from eating as much meat as they might today, the political expression of that is support for an organization like Compassion and Wealth Up. And that means that your lifestyle change is reinforced by your standing up for organizations that then make it possible to reduce the negative impacts of that lifestyle change that you've just moved away from yourself. And those two things go hand in hand. Yeah. Well, we're very aligned on this. It's <laughs> <laughs> your your answers are the the same ones that I give when I'm asked the question. So I'm reassured that <laughs> <laughs> well, my job is done, Amisha. That's fine. That's okay. As long as I've left you feeling reassured rather than discombobulated by <laughs> counter answers. It's a funny thing. Yeah. Yeah. For me, a big part of this moment is that there's actually like a clarity that's there around the complexity. And I found that that clarity has made it easier to navigate the complexity and to see where different parts of our lives and our lifestyles and our communities and our societies are interlinked and to find the ways of showing up in these different aspects. And for me, that's what being a leader, an active citizen, a human at this time in this age of climate change is really about. It's, you know, it's a big ask, isn't it, this time? But I think there's always been a big ask every time. Exactly. (laughs) This is ours. This is ours. And it's quite cosy compared to other times. (laughs) You know, speaking. Yeah, we're in like warm houses, communicating with people all over the world through these devices. Of course, that's not the reality for everyone because we are in a time where there's very, very polarized realities on this planet. And this pandemic has shown up in very different ways for different people, depending on circumstance. Exactly. It's allowed us to reflect, for instance, on what is or isn't essential in our economy to make life possible for every member of society. And we've constantly devalued the contribution of people who we've now realized are absolutely essential, whether it's a frontline health practitioner or someone working in social care or delivery drivers, you know, suddenly in this world where everything's gone online and many people are shopping online, not shopping physically, dependence on that whole logistical system has changed people's perception. What, you know, what's really going on out there? And community activists and the people who've organized these incredible support schemes for neighbors and more vulnerable members of their community. These are, these are the essential people in our society now. And I think people have moved towards a better understanding of what essential workers really means which is hugely important because I think we'd lost an understanding of that. I really do. I hope that endures. The really big thing in all of this COVID story is how much of these enforced changes that have happened since the start of the pandemic, how many of them will sustain 
and help us to build better ways of living together afterwards. That's that's an area of intense speculation, and I don't have much clarity on that as yet. You can see some things which will stick, and some things, I suspect, which won't. And Jonathan, where have you found your personal resilience to keep doing the work that you're doing and to stay engaged and active? Yeah, it's a mixture of different things. It is a privilege to be able to do the kind of work I do. You know, I'm a, whatever you like to describe the kind of work we do. It's a joy to be involved working with people who share a passion for making the world a better place for everyone. And I have felt that from the very first moment that I, I had a very privileged background. I instantly, pretty much instantly after university, realized that that isn't how the vast majority of human beings live on this planet. I mean, literally, I was born into a kind of crazy world of elite privilege that are experienced by infinitesimally small numbers of people. And the only thing I I can really thank my parents for is that not only did they make that possible for me, but they then told me at every point, do not think this is the way most people live. You are a lucky, unbelievably lucky, privileged person. And you better turn that now into something that helps make a difference to other people. You had nothing to do with where you were born and the family you were born into and the first 18 or 20 years of your life, not much to do with that. But from now on, it's your task, your duty. And that sense of privilege has informed me all the way through. And there's no moment where I don't celebrate that. I've loved every minute of my working life. But it can be emotionally very stressful. I mean, let's be honest. You know what it's like. You get to read an awful lot of deeply upsetting stuff about the state of the world and its people and the cruelty involved in so much of that world, lack of compassion. So then one has to develop other resources to kind of deal with that. And for me, that's the combination of being in nature. Well, I was asking you about earth practice and being grounded, and that's served me well over many decades. I'm a genuine, full-on, unapologetic tree hugger from way back, and and I just know how much I draw. I draw from that contact with the natural world. And I think I'm relatively lucky. I, I don't get stressed out. I get deeply concerned and worried for other people. But for myself, I kind of have a, a sense of resilience, which I've been fortunate in having. So it's, you know, it's a muddle, isn't it? We're all a muddle in that respect. But then family, two wonderful kids, wonderful partnership with my wife for more than 30 years. These things provide constancy and and security and i think the more bits that help you feel security in your life the easier it is to deal with the bits that make you feel insecure if the whole of your life is suddenly looking as if it's not as that none of it's built on solid foundations and the whole lot is somehow at risk I've never been in that position. I, I know a lot of people who have, but I've never been in that position myself. Well, I can tell you as someone that's been in, in that position, <laughs> more often than not, you learn a different kind of resilience and you're able to offer it a different perspective. Yeah, sometimes I've questioned, like, why has all of this been necessary? Partnerships that didn't work out, babies that haven't happened yet, steady home space all that kind of thing even positions within organizations that didn't work out that and freelance you know that just a kind of 15 years of being freelance you know it's like it, it's a lot but then somewhere within it all I definitely feel like I've gathered a skill set that is of this time and I'm able to share with others some of those skills that wouldn't have been possible had things had been easier. But we all have a different, a different piece in this. We surely do. And as long as they're all mutually reinforcing and you know, offered with that same sense of love and service, as you put it earlier, then that diversity 
speaks volumes. That's what will get us through really very difficult times. Yeah. Hope not hell. Hang Hope in there. Not hell. Just don't, don't let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I'm hanging quite loosely, actually, with it. Well, I, I'd say we all have our um, oh yeah our moments <laughs> with with the clinging Absolutely. and the like. It's, it's all like right. Sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> so hang in there. Yeah. So thank you so much for your. Yeah, it's been lovely. Very nice conversation and lovely to spend time with you. How would you like people to connect with you further? Obviously, we would like everyone to read your new book. You got that in one. You see, that's it. That's <laughs> literally it. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't been over-plugging it, you see. So I, I have a website which tells people quite a bit about the sort of work I do in, on a, more on a day-to-day -day basis. Put a lot of me into the book, that's for sure, including a lot of stuff about some of these issues to do with spirituality and values and what makes it possible to continue to do this kind of work. So it's not just a, a tract on climate change. It is actually about hope, as you might guess from the title. <laughs> Interesting timing of the sirens <laughs> in the call to hope. There we go. Now or never. Can you share your website URL as well, just so that people can get it into their minds? www.jonathanporrit.org org whatever it is i guess excellent yep, yeah and my url is at jonathan porrit is that on twitter the oh that's my twitter handle. Yeah. sorry but be warned i'm not a hugely active twitter person for reasons i explained earlier i'm <laughs> I, I ration my my twitter contact time pretty harshly if i spend on average in a week 15 minutes on twitter that's enough for me that seems like a, a good amount of time <laughs> for Twitter. And I'm not on any platform, so I abominate Facebook. And I'm not interested in Instagram. So, yeah, it, it, it simplifies things for me. And makes it possible for you to write books. So we're, we're very exactly. grateful for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?